All right, you guys, I'm going to show you how to open the 3D viewer, view things in the 3D viewer, and some of the basic concepts revolving around 3D texturing. So first, before we actually get into all of this stuff, I've got Maya open right here, which you're not expecting to know, so don't panic. Okay, I'm just opening this to show you what happens when you have a 3D model and you want to paint on it. Okay. So here is a pumpkin that I made uh, over the weekend real quick, and I unwrapped it, which means taking all of these three-dimensional surfaces and converting them into a flat version like this. Okay, So all of these are somewhere on this pumpkin over here. If I use one of our component modes, and if you guys are interested in 3D, we've got a lot of courses, and I start hovering over parts of this model you can see them highlight over in that field over there and so those are exactly where the texture will show up so as I go up right we end up going up on this big lemon shaped thing until we go all the way around down and then we can't see it entirely but inside underneath the stem there's more faces and then it gets cut off okay if I go down again all the way down across the surface down, 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 down to the very bottom. I actually cut it open into a little circle here. So right here, it ends and it's cut. And then here, there are three little floating islands. I don't know why I didn't stitch them together. I probably should have. But that means this constitutes the very bottom of the pumpkin, which is cut up like this because it doesn't matter very much. We're not going to look down there. We don't need any nice detail. And so if this is separate from this, then it's not really going to mess us up very much. If you can think about how we would want to paint and decorate like a pumpkin, like a jack-o'-lantern, we're going to want a face right around here somewhere. Okay, I'm actually selecting straight through everything, so let me just do that. We're going to want a face around here somewhere. So the reason this is unwrapped this way is because, take a look at that, we've got a nice big area on this grid to do our face decoration. But there's a whole lot of extra space out there too. Most of that is just kind of a necessity of unwrapping things. Generally, you want things to be flat, otherwise they'll distort. Uh, this is in the article if you read up the whole thing, but I do have a display mode to uh, show this. If I click this button here, you can see this big checkerboard with these letters pops up. And we look at the pumpkin, we can see that projected onto it. So the idea is that we don't want a lot of distortion in these little squares. These squares are turning into rectangles, we've got a problem. If they're stretching way, way out, then we've got a big problem. So you can see on this particular pumpkin, I've got one third of it, which is much, much bigger, and then two thirds of it, which is much, much smaller. So that means these sides of the pumpkin are not meant to take a face or a lot of detail, and this side of the pumpkin is meant to take a face and a lot of detail, okay? Uh, the other ones that I have are unwrapped differently. I'll show you all th um, three objects in just a little bit. But just know that that's the reason for this one, that if you choose this one to um, paint on top of, your face is meant to go right in the middle of this big lemon so that we can see it nice and undistorted there. Um, there are places where the texture suddenly changes, like between this wedge and these other wedges. We call that a texture seam. Um, they're not always a um, really bad thing. For instance, in this example here, there's a texture seam between the stem of the mushroom and the underside of the mushroom and the top of the mushroom. You can tell that because there are three separate areas on this map. Um, in this case, it doesn't matter at all because we don't need any texture detail to cross around those details. On the pumpkin, it matters a little bit, but I positioned those texture seams right in the middle of a crease. So as long as you're using basically the same kind of color for your orange all the way around, you're not really going to see it. But if you put a lot of texture detail right there, right on those edges, which would be this curving line, this curving line, and these curving lines, then you're going to have a problem and you're going to see a lot of texture detail where it shouldn't be. Okay, So that's the idea here. This is how we view a 3D model and how we break it up into a two-dimensional sheet. Then we take this and we export it and it becomes kind of like a coloring book. So that's where Photoshop comes in. I'm going to show you how to open and set up all these files in the fullness of time, but for the moment, just know that, there we go, this is the 
UV snapshot like we were just seeing. Let me turn all these off. In fact, let me use the one we were just looking at. Here it is. This is the UV snapshot we were just looking at. Okay. So this big lemon shape and all that. And then underneath that layer is the painting that I made as an example for this. So just painting it generally orange. And you can put in extra little bits of detail and stuff. And I'll probably do a little bit better example in just a little while of painting this up. But I've painted the stem green, the top a little bit lighter green, the body orange, and then just put a small little example face on there. One thing to be aware of is that we do have to save a PSD file, or if you're working in Krita, a KRA file, because all of these layers are contained in that file. Any adjustments, whatever, just like our previous paintings, we want to save that in here. But the output that we want for this needs to be identical to the original file that uh, you have the outlines on. So that's going to be a PNG. I've got mine over here on the other desktop. There it is, uh, pumpkin1.png. It has to be saved exactly like that because the files that we're going to use to view are looking for exactly that name. So if you don't have exactly that name, we won't be able to tell what yours is. Um, so don't rename it. It's going to be more convenient to just make a folder in the turn in uh, drive and just drop your same named file right in that folder. Okay, but that's the texture. We've got the three files, which uh, I guess I didn't open Google Drive, but it is in the uh, write up a object file, OBJ, a material file, MTL, and a texture file, PNG. So if I take my web browser here and go to the online viewer, which I have a link to in the homework, and drag all three of those files at the same time, so see, all three of them dragged into the window at the same time then we should get a pumpkin with our texture on it. There it is. It does orient itself in a kind of weird way initially, but I found if you just click this button right here, set up, um, up vector Y, then spin it around, there's the face. Okay. So the parts that I colored green are green, light green. We can see the texture detail running out here because I didn't put it on the smaller wedge. And then these two would be a exact copy of each other because they're overlapping on that sheet. Okay, the bottom is a little bit messed up, but we don't need to look there. And there's the face that I painted on the pumpkin. Okay, so that's a basic rundown of what we're looking at this week. Any questions so far, keeping in mind that I'm going to demonstrate how to do all of this stuff in just a moment. Any concept questions like what what's going on? Where am I? What day is this? Who am I? Etc. I see somebody typing. No? Okay. Cool. Do I need to download or make from scratch? You do not need to make anything from scratch. All of these object, all of these uh, files, in fact, let me go get the Google Drive really quick to show you exactly where they are. So I'm going to go into Drive for just a second. There we go. Fall. All right, so inside your class folder, which there's a link to on Canvas, of course, resources, 3D models. Each one of these folders contains all the necessary files for each one of these variants. And I'm going to show you all three variants in just a moment. So pumpkin version one, we need the MTL OBJ PNG. Don't rename anything. Pumpkin version two, MTL OBJ PNG. Don't rename anything. Gravestone. Sling, sing along with me, PNG, MTL, OBJ, don't rename anything, okay? You just need all three, and the only thing you change is the PNG. You just save over it. Okay, well, they're right here. Resources, 3D models, each one of these folders. And if you're still having trouble in a little while, then I'll try to help you out uh, finding those. But they're right in our class folder, just exactly where we turn in all of our homework. All right, so that's one of the pumpkins. The other pumpkin right here is unwrapped slightly differently because it makes it a little bit easier to tell uh, what's going to happen to your paint if I unwrap it like this. It looks a little bit messy, but just consider this to be a big horizontal strip all the way around the pumpkin. Okay, It will actually give you two faces on your pumpkin, but don't worry about that. 
and it means that any of your detail can just go straight up and down and it shouldn't be too much of a big deal. But I will say that this one is a better unwrapping job with less distortion if you can wrap your head around that these bending lines are vertical. So it does get a little bit distorted as you get to the seams, but that should be fine because you're not supposed to paint very much over the seams. Okay, And then horizontal is just any line that's running straight around. This is the top, this is the bottom. Same for over here, this is the top, this is the bottom. Okay, So two different options for a pumpkin. This one we could view just as easily as the other one. So I've got this on my desktop as well. And pumpkin two, pumpkin two, pumpkin two, grabbed all three files, drag them in, boom, there we go. You can see it's a little bit distorted on this one and he's got a second face, hello. But all the detail goes straight across, straight around. So if you prefer that one, go for it. The third file is a gravestone I've used before, but I just really like it. I decided to make a simpler one for this pumpkin because some people were confused about how the gravestone works. Here's the gravestone. You can see it's got a lot of colors. So this one's UV texture sheet is color coded because there's kind of a lot going on here. But essentially the blue is the front, the red is the back, and you can find all of the other bits based on their colors. But you would have to uh, put your textures in the appropriate place to show up on this gravestone. And I can show you what the sheet looks like for that one. Let's just drag it in here. Here we go. Whoop. It's a wrong size, but just an example anyway. Yeah, let's place. Wait, what is this? Oh, oh, whoops, I grabbed Dirty object. Yeah, I grabbed them all. No wonder it did that. Okay. Let's see. Am I back? Not quite. I think I have snapping turned off. Okay, well, that's going to be close enough for this anyway. So here's the sheet for the gravestone. So I believe that it was. Which one was front? Blue. Blue is front, red is back. You can see dark purple is the front of the pedestal. Uh, what are we going to call that? Really bright purple is the back of the pedestal. I'll put this on the other screen. So that means that this is the front, that's the back, this is the right side of the edge, this is the left side of the edge. Crucifix front and back are combined. This is the little tiny pedestal on the bottom of the crucifix. Larger pedestal. Then we got the front, back, and top of the base of the gravestone, as well as I believe the sides are here and here. Okay, And it all kind of hooks up. So wherever one of these uh, white lines ends, another one picks up that texture somewhere else. So for instance, let's get a, how about we get a little pink stripe. Right here, this represents a little um, a little notch in the stone. Let's see if we can find it. There we go. So it represents this notch in the stone. The little green part and then also the blue part. So right where the edge is on this green, right? That's right here, right there, okay? So if I want a detail to go across that edge, I would have to be very, very careful and try to position its counterpart right there, okay? So if you can kind of play Tetris or connect the dots sort of, you can see that this piece slots into this part right here. Generally, you shouldn't do this, okay? Wherever there's a texture seam, just treat that like you shouldn't go over um, that line with anything important. You do have to, however, paint directly over top that line so that you don't leave gaps in your painting. So that's why all of these are solid colored little islands that kind of stretch right over those areas. But you shouldn't paint anything important. Just for the sake of a test though, We'll go ahead and save this and I'll redrag the gravestone in to see if I've correctly lined up that little dot. And if I haven't, then what I could do is grab one or the other and just carefully adjust it along this line somewhere to try to get it to line up. But it's not very fun to do, is what I will say. So let me go ahead and save as. So I'm gonna save as to my desktop. It has to be the exact same name as the gravestone. So I've got a PNG and what's the name of it? Grave texture.png. So I just select it, say save. Do you want to replace? Yes, I do. And then in the web browser, there we go. I'm going to drag those three files in object, MTL, and PNG. 
Okay, so there we go. And now with my one little edit, we can see there's the detail, but I'm pretty far off. Okay. It's not super critical for this assignment to be able to line up things like this. In fact, like I'm saying, you probably should not uh, try to do detail like this, but we can give it a shot adjusting this. It looks like not only is it a little bit too far down the line on the green side, it's also a little bit too big because they're not the same size for some reason. So I can grab this part and move it up the line just a little bit like that and maybe shrink it also just a little bit to see if that will work properly. Okay. Remember, I'm still inside a PSD file, which would be our native file for doing all of my edits, but I'm going to file save as every time I want to check this. And I'm changing it to, oh, sorry, let's drag this window over so you can see. Change this to a PNG. Find where that is, grave texture.png. Save over it. Do you want to replace it? Yes, I do. Okay. Then drag all three files back into the web browser window. Okay, same type, same name, same everything. Let's see, did I do it? Oh yeah. About as good as it's gonna get. Okay, so by doing that iteratively, making a, a few little changes here and there, and then uploading your file over and over and over again to take a look at it, you can get pretty accurate. If you want to do some kinds of special effects, if you want to make sure that you're painting something upright as opposed to upside down, if you want to look at how some effect is working, you can do something like that. So for instance, on the gravestone, putting like moss on the pediment, as well as the side of the gravestone, would be a, a really nice detail if you could line it up such that it looks like it crawls up and down the side of the gravestone. Okay. Questions? I see one. And no, you do not rename it to JPEG, you leave it as PNG. Uh, the texture files can't be inserted in credit. Yes, they can. I don't think that was a question. That seemed more like a statement, but yes, they can. They can all be in, put into Krita. Okay, well, I'm going to show right now how to do that. I'll show it in Photoshop first, but then I will show it in Krita as well. I'm going to close this PSD file because we want to start completely fresh the way that you guys would be doing your assignment. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just open one of the three texture files. Oh, you know what? Mine already have painting on them. Let me re-download them from the um, drive folder really quick because the three that I have already have stuff painted all over them. All right, so I'm just going to download this one. And the gravestone one actually comes with all those colors on it to make it a little bit clearer. But the other two are just UV snapshots. So they're actually really thin grayish lines that are a little bit hard to see. So don't be put off by that it's still going to work just fine. Okay, I'm going to replace those on my desktop. There we go. And make sure I've got the right set with each other. That's number one. That's number two. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just open this in Photoshop. You can do file open on a PNG or you can just drag it just like this. And you're probably going to see something like this when you first open it. Which is like, oh no, something broken is wrong. But actually nothing's wrong. Uh, UV unwrapped sheets look like this. If you zoom in, you can kind of see, there they are, there's the lines, okay? But the background is transparent. This is a good thing because we have to do our painting underneath these lines so that we can see all the edges and what we're doing. But it means we're gonna have to add at least one layer behind this first. So I'm gonna name this layer uh, UV so that I don't mistake it for other ones. You could also take the step of locking the transparency right away so you don't accidentally paint on it. I'm going to make a new layer, put it underneath, and then fill it with anything. Pink will do. So we can at least see the lines. I find that this is okay, but a little obnoxious because of the way it looks. So I prefer then to change this layer either to multiply or screen. And because it's got kind of this gray mixture, you can do either one, depending on what you're painting. If you're gonna paint with a lot of light colors, choose multiply. If you're gonna paint with a lot of dark colors, uh, choose screen. So let's just do, um, let's do multiply. 
because orange is probably going to tend towards the lighter side. So there's the lines. And just for an example screen, we can probably arguably see it better on this color with that one. Okay. So this layer we use as our template the entire time that we're doing our painting process. Okay. And you can use as many other layers as you want, but you should ideally fill the entire thing with color on at least one layer. I like to pick a neutral grayish color oftentimes just because it doesn't get in the way or whatever the predominant color is of the thing I'm painting. So for instance, orange, I might just fill the entire thing with orange to start out and then do my details on other layers. So let me start out. I'll set this up with a, um, let's do a streaky marker and a hard transparency eraser. Oh, got to test it with a different color. There we go. There's my streaky marker and I'll do a second layer here so I can paint something. Uh, let's just check everything. So I'm going to paint a big upward facing arrow on these two little cutout bits. Okay. I'll paint a big old happy face here. Okay. And this one, let's see, I will paint a pink line over the edge on this side, but not the other side, just to see which is top and bottom. And then let's choose some different colors just for our test. How about green? So down here in this little circle, we already know what this is, but I'll just do it anyway. Uh, I'll just paint a little blob of green right in the middle there. And then over here, I'll paint uh, about blue on this one, just so I can see that everything is where it says it is and is lined up and is facing the direction that I expect. So here's my little test setup. I'm going to save this as a PSD first. So you would probably want to save this with your first and last name or whatever. Um, I'll just do test pumpkin. But remember, we're going to have to leave the exact same name for the PNG. So the PNG I've already got on my desktop, but I'm going to need the exact same name for that when I do my test. This is arbitrary. So I'll just go ahead and save. When you do your test, it's probably going to be best if you turn off the UV layer every time you save it. Otherwise, you're going to see these lines. For the first test, though, I'll just leave the lines on because they're not going to be relevant for this. Save as PNG. Okay, Find the one that you're working on. I was working on pumpkin one. Okay. Exact same name, exact same file extension. Save. Do you want to replace it? Yes, I do. Okay. And now in the browser. I can drag all three files in. So we've got pumpkin, object, material, and texture. There we go. So let's see what we've got. There's my big arrow on my featured side. Oh, you know what? What did I do? Did I do that arrow on the little one or the big one? I thought I did it. Oh, I did do it on the little one. Oops. Okay, so I've got two arrows because this was chopped up into thirds. And I've got one big happy face on the other one, the actual featured side. I've got my green blob on the little cutout bit at the bottom, blue blob on the top, and there's the pink edge that I drew across one side of that strip. So that's the top portion of this stem. That's the bottom portion of the stem. Okay. So yeah, basically that's all the mechanical stuff that you need to know just how to save your native file so you don't lose any data, how to save as the PNG and match it to the name, and how to drag all three things in here. After that, it's up to how fancy you want your painting to look. Okay. Any questions so far about that setup? Everybody good so far with that? Yes, sir. Okay, let's take a look at Krita, because it should be exactly the same. Opening up credit. This is my song. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm just going to drag in pumpkin to PNG. There it is. Same sort of thing. Transparent in the background, lines over the top, a little bit annoying to look at initially. New layer. Fill some sort of background. Let's just do that color, will be fine. Where's the bucket in Krita? There it is. Okay, and put it beneath. 
There we go. Kind of obnoxious looking, but if we change this UV layer to screen or multiply, let's just do screen. There we go. And you could even turn the opacity down a little bit if it's annoying you. I'm going to go ahead and name it UV. And I'll name this one base. Probably want to lock the UV layer or something just to make sure you don't accidentally paint on it. So we've got this reddish color to start off with. Cool. Uh, let's do a few little blips and blobs around here to test that everything's in the right place. So here's my first layer that I'll be painting on. And I'll go ahead and save initially as a .kra. OK, so when I just hit save, it chose PNG. So apparently Krita works slightly different from Photoshop. We don't want that. We want to save as a Krita document. There we go. And I'll call this test two. OK, so that's my native file. Then I'm going to do my little blobs and stuff and export as a PNG. So here we'll just get green and say, um, we'll do a face right here in the middle. I'm not actually sure where the face should go on this one. I think in the middle is where I intended it. Um, just to test, I'll do like a triangle here, a circle here. Whoa, that's, what's going on? Wow, that was weird. I was doing some straight line thing. Maybe I was hitting a button by accident. Circle over there. Uh, let's do, we'll do like a blue wobbly line across the top. Notice I'm going outside of the lines over and over. That means we're not gonna see any of this stuff that goes outside the bounds. So blue line over the top. I also want to see exactly where this seam is. So I'm just going to paint a solid blue right over that seam. And I won't do it on this side so we can see. On the stem, I'll do the same thing I did last time, just a darker red over the top here. And how about a red dot and a cyan dot. Okay. None of this will matter. I there. None of that will matter. This is all unused space. So if you want to save like your color palette out here, just put a few daubs of the various paint colors that you're using out in this region. That's perfectly fine. You can do whatever you want. We're not going to be able to see it on the 3D object. I will be able to see it in the folder. So don't do anything horrible out in that space. All right. So here we go. We've got our document set up. I'm going to save. That's the Krita file. I'm going to turn the UV layer off this time and do File Save As a PNG. Okay, and remember I need to change that name. So Pumpkin 2 PNG, exact same name that we started with. Do I want to replace it? Yes, I do. Okay, then in the web browser, drag all three files. There we go. Okay, so there's my happy face. It's a little bit low, but nice and big. Triangle on this side. Circle is cut off because I think it's the way that I chopped it up. So I saw there was one extra. Let's see here. Yeah, okay, so there's one sheet here that ends. It also ends right about here. And then there's a second sheet that goes the entire width. So just avoid any detail right along that space and of course right along the two edges and you should be fine. Um, honestly I don't like how this one's unwrapped very much. I just wanted to give some option. I'm looking at it and it's it's not nearly as good as the other one but oh well. Blue dot on the bottom. Here's the blue stripe which denotes the end of the entire texture. right? So there's the right hand side. Here's the left hand side. Our wobbly line is viewable like this, um, which means that some of those polygons go underneath this stem. So you really don't have to worry about the details on the top of that big sheet. They're just going to be covered up. And that's same for the other one. Uh, pink line across the top here, pink daub on the top. There we go. And we can see everything's upright and it's all working correctly. All right. So hopefully that worked. Uh, Lilia, you got to read the instructions carefully. You have to use the Chrome browser. I've tried it in other browsers and it doesn't work. You also have to drag all three files and all three files have to be named exactly. If you don't do all of that stuff correct, then it won't work.
Okay. Then you have to drag all three files at the same time, not one at a time, and it will only work if you do that. And you can't be renaming them. They can't be copy of pumpkin two. You have to have all three of those files. Any questions about the way this is set up in either Photoshop or Krita? Guys, good. All right. What do you want to see? If the answer is nothing, then it's a very short class, and I'll show Salvo how to uh, export an OBJ from Maya, because that's what he wanted to see. And I'll see if I can help Lilia with uh, making the 3D viewer work. Or I could do a quick example of either pumpkin or the gravestone. Nobody's answering. I'll pick the lazy thing, I swear to God. Yeah. I was able to upload the uh, OBJ file in, in Maya. Uh-huh. OBJ. But um, but the UV editor. I opened the UV editor and saved the PNG. And it, but, it, but it worked uh, fine in Photoshop. Um, you cut out there for a second. I didn't quite catch all of that. Hello? Yeah, wait, one second. One, one second. I'm trying to clarify. Mm hmm Oh, we got a question. Jane and Maya and it worked fine. Uh-huh. Then when I put it in the UV editor, I saved it as a PNG. And then when I opened up Photoshop, it worked fine. Uh-huh. Do all of the all three files need to be exported to the three D modeler? Yes. So, but I, I couldn't put it in Maya the Maya file, just the the two files. One was from my uh, from Photoshop from painting, and then I, I just put all then I just drag all three files into the modeler. And, and that's it. If you if you have an object file and an .mtl, which is exported along with an object file when you save it, and a file associated with that of whatever name you chose, and you drag all three things in, then it should work. And I can I can demonstrate that, but not just yet because most of these guys aren't using 3D anyway, and so I want to make sure that I get them all squared away before I actually just walk through that. But I'll show you I'll show you the whole process in just a little bit. Uh, Elias, does any text have to look like it's actually carved in? Well, that would be a good idea. You guys want an easy way to do that? Okay, well that's a really easy way. <laughs> yes, technically. I'm going to show you guys what he's talking about. All right? So I've got a new, new layer. Let me just turn that one off. And let's just do... I'll do a really sloppy one too. Do, 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 do. Like that. And we'll change the layer style. We actually haven't gone over any layer styles because they're frequently abused. And I'm probably going to regret showing you guys this right now, but what the heck? Why not? Double click. And we have all of these different layer sty styles, and they're lots of fun. And you should really not use them most of the time because they look awful unless you work a bit harder on them. Uh, Bevelin Boss is right here. When I turn it on, I get this barely noticeable effect until I turn the size up and I can turn the depth up. And I start to get this like, okay, is that carved into a pumpkin? Well, no. How about direction down? Okay, maybe. Let's turn the depth all the way up, soften down. 
size I'm gonna leave like right around here and we can do lots of other things so I could say like make it apply only to the area around the thing I've painted emboss or outer bevel only like literally the outside of these black spaces never the inside that's one option I can move the lighting direction around top bottom and it starts to mess with our perception of it so I can go really really high and severe like that I can change the way that it applies color and how uh, opaque it is so linear dodge is its default I'm just gonna set it to um, screen and I'll pick a yellowish color instead of a white and then for the multiply mode I'll choose a what should I choose how about something in the purple range a little bit saturated very dark I'll leave it on multiply but you know what my light angle right now is such that it didn't matter there we go there it is uh, so if I can get all of this lining up just right maybe I can get it to look about chisel hard Ooh, chisel soft Slightly less depth, a little bit more softened maybe. Ooh, there's maybe no coming back from that. I don't know what's going on. There we go. So that kind of looks like it's chiseled in. The Forbidden Arts, yeah. What I'd prefer is if you painted it in such a way that it looks the way you'd like it to. So that was an example there. But let's do this instead. So this time I'm going to draw you know my basic shape that I want like so here's my cutout I've still got a really streaky brush on but this time it's not gonna matter I'm gonna paint everything all right so if I want to make it look like this is cut out again I kind of just have to draw or paint a stripe underneath or on top of this stuff of the right color kind of like we were painting that guy last time so why don't I just make a layer under this like that and let me use my highlight color so my like kind of bright yellow and I'll just put a edge here and that basically what we just achieved with that layer style there we go yeah it's basically what we did and we could make it go up the sides a little bit if we want to maybe cheat it a little bit like that or detail it much much better than this if we really tried but there you are. You got kind of a little little thing going on there. We'd even do this right over the top if we want to blend stuff. I'll use my highlight color and then just sample it and get kind of this half tone. We could even blend this going back so it's like the light is running out or use any of the painting techniques that we learned last time to do clipping masks on top of this stuff and you know blend it all together really nice and whatever. But you get this nice kind of like painted styled look on this simple little pumpkin face there we go starting to look a little bit more convincing probably want to resort to better brushes and a little bit more time thought through but there you are we could erase out some teeth for them and add little details so I could like lock the transparency choose my darker gray put it in like right there and here so we can kind of see there we go <laughs> yeah quality okay so do you does it have to look like it is carved in uh, no you can paint this pumpkin however you want but if you want it to look like a jack-o-lantern then probably want to try to figure out how to make it look three-dimensional All right, you guys, any other questions about how to approach this? Or would you like to see me paint one of these objects quickly? Actually, I kind of just did, but <laughs> like to preview this, we would just turn off the UV layer, save the PNG, drag them all in. Are you allowed to use other forbidden methods? You can use whatever methods you want. like copying and pasting yes but don't just plagiarize like if you find a texture of a photographic pumpkin and you put it on here that's okay but do some more work over the top of that if that's what you're gonna do 
Um, let me see if I could find something like that, just because it's all kind of up in the air. I don't really mind what you do. So I could grab something like that, which has got a nice big flat area of pumpkin and stick it into my document. It's not going to make the entire thing look perfect immediately, but it'd be a nice place to start and at least a good way to sample some colors. Well, I think that's a pretty good one to start off with. So I'm going to drag this to my desktop real fast and then throw that into the document, make it significantly larger like this, put that underneath my painting layers. Okay. Yeah. So right now it's just going to be kind of a stupid looking pumpkin picture on the side of an otherwise much larger pumpkin. But if I were really careful about this, then I could start sampling colors. Let's use a softer brush, do a marker blend. Um, so I could start sampling colors here and on a layer above this I could start blending it in and kind of get a nicer modeled kind of pumpkin texture going. Now that unfortunately this does have a lot of lighting on it this pumpkin so we've got a dark side and a light side but you might be able to figure out a way to overcome that or just use it for your first pass kind of approach on your painting or something. So don't just use like photographic textures. Try to do something with it. Um, treat it a little bit more like a painting. But if you know how to like photo edit already, you can photo edit this if you want. And I can give you advice on how to do that if you prefer. We haven't gotten into that yet, but we will. I could start blending this in. And there are lots of photo editing tools for grabbing parts of textures and combining them in interesting ways. but. Just know that this alone isn't going to look very good. You'd be better off just painting it. Can I upload the pumpkin I did at the beginning of the month? Uh, if you know how to export PNG, MTL, and, and PNG, then go for it. I just need all three files. Yeah, it looks kind of silly, doesn't it? I think it looks gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. All right, I think that is it for the lecture, and I'm going to help Lilia, and I'm going to demonstrate for Salvo, unless there are any other questions and things you want me to show. I think we're good. Use reference. If you want your pumpkin to look illuminated, look at pictures of lit pumpkins. If you want it to look like it is painted on, then look at examples where maybe they've painted on top of it. If you want it to look like a pumpkin that has no carving at all, that's up to you. If you want to try to make it look really stylistic, that's fine. Or one of these crazy ones. Or like an unlit pumpkin. Just look up some reference. All right, you guys. That's it for the official lecture. I'll go ahead and stop the recording right now and I'll help everybody who remains.